Hello! I have been sat down at my desk for a while going through my notes from World Congress on Abdominal and Pelvic Pain. There are so many, I wrote like a very small book. Um, so I'm trying to bring together the most important bits clinically that as a physio you may want to know about. Um, and I've got a few bits and bobs that I think you might be more interested in than other stuff. Obviously there's a vast amount, you, you need to go to these conferences to get the most out of them. but. Um, hopefully I'll be able to bring you a few little bits and bobs if you weren't able to make it. So to start off with make sure you get a cup of tea. Um, I am drinking today Earl Grey decaf in my um, m and J mug um, and this might take a while so pause here if you need to and get yourself a cup of tea and sit down. And a pad and paper in case there's anything interesting you want to talk about. So first off um, let's finish off the bladder pain syndrome what was it called? Um, little segmenty thing. Um, third speaker in that amazing, amazing um, bit of the conference was Dr. Ken Peters, who I have been quoting for years. He wrote one of my favourite papers um, that I use for uh, justifying physiotherapy. He wrote that paper, that paper that if people code to my course, I chat about all the time. Um, to Peters, 2007. If you treat the bladder or if you treat pelvic pain, or if you, um, if you treat bladder pain syndrome, and pain remains in the pelvic floor, then they will not get better. Then your outcome, your long-term outcome, will be poor. Peters, 2007. Um, so he was there, so I was total fan girl again. Um, really, <laughs> really embarrassing, but thankfully I managed to just, you know, be in the shadows and not kind of be too scare, scary for him. Anyway, so he talked about the role of the peripheral nervous system. I've got my computers and my notes and everything set up, so I'm sorry if I'm not talking directly at you for a while. Um, he was talking about there being two distinct phenotypes of BPS, and we've had kind of three different theories about that. So we've had the U-point system, which is a way of gently phenotyping into what areas were more specific, uh, specific problems for each individual, trying to be a little bit more individualised, although I really don't like it because I think it over medicalises and everyone's different. Um, then we've got that kind of pain within the pelvis, pain outside the pelvis phenotype that Jason Kutch talked about that I think it was a nickel and chip paper um, 2015. I really like that um, and it seems to fit in with a lot of what people were saying from conference which was uh, the importance of widespreadness of pain and how um, you get a, a coming together of lots of different symptoms in widespread pain and in more specific um, localised pain we treat very differently. So Dr Peter was talking, that, talking about that a little bit and he was talking about how people with active Hunter's ulcers, now Hunter's ulcers are a big contentious area that we know you can have Hunter's ulcers and no bladder pain so they're not really specific, but in those with active Hunter's ulcers, bleeding, horrible, and they tend to be the ones with that type 3C, stenotic, tiny volume bladder, they're passing frequent um, frequency, uh, passing frequency is something like, you know, 20 times um, every two hours, uh, you know, really, really small voiding for, um, vo volumes, that he sees that as one phenotype, that's the kind of true interstitial cystitis, and then everyone else is something else, which is quite interesting. And importantly, I think it's important to note that most of our patients are in that second bracket. They've got lots of other comorbidities, they've got lots of other things going on, and you don't need to be just thinking about treating the Hunter's ulcers or thinking about their gag layer replacement or installations to the bladder. You want to be thinking more about the whole patient and what's going on in their environment, their ecosphere. Um, he, he made some really nice comments um, that I wrote down verbatim, so defining IC as a bladder disease oversimplifies the situation as nothing has shown bladder specific treatments to be effective. Lovely. Um, and I made that, get that made into a card or a tattoo or something. My other tattoo is the one that says it's not about the wand, it's what you do with it. Um, so or what, what process occurs when you're using the wand. Um, the second thing he said was to identify all the triggers and chip away at them. Um, so there's multiple comorbidities and I think that's that's something we saw coming through quite often is that you wanted to, um, you, when, when you're treating bladder pain you need to be really thinking about all the different comorbidities that are going on in that patient and you need to have the skills and the tools in your to toolbox to be flexible in how you treat and manage um, each individual that comes through the door because they are an individual and their nervous system. Um, 
There were some great messages for his urology colleagues. Colleagues, So again, same thing, treat the organ and we're not going to do well. Stop treating the organ. Look at it, observe it, make sure they haven't got cancer, but then give it to a physio. Um, it, the patient. Then he posed a question, which I might pose to you. Is chronic pain a symptom or a disease? And I think that's really interesting. Um, certainly from everything that I have learnt and listened to at World Congress in Washington, it's a, possibly a bit of both. Well, very definitely a bit of both, but um, it makes me really think about the, from, from an immunological, po immunological point of view and from a genetic point of view, um, whether there is this underlying something that means that patients are more likely to get bulbodynia and bladder pain syndrome and IBS and musculoskeletal symptoms of chronic pain or is it the result of something? Want to talk to me about on Twitter or on Facebook? Um, and he then talked a lot about neuromodulation, so um, we know it as SNS in the UK, sacral nerve stimulation, um, and he talked about the two routes being pudendal nerve or sacral nerve routes, and those are both effective in bladder pain syndrome, and now um, they're so effective at modulating how that neural activity is happening within the pelvis, they're now looking at using it in um, persistent genital arousal disorder. Um, effectively to really help people change their lives and um, it's pretty gruesome but it really works for some patients so um, great really getting significant reduction in pain levels the interesting thing is a it's not yet um, approved for pain even though they're getting a concurrent reduction in pain in their patients with um, uh, bladder pains um, bladder symptoms versions in frequency and also, it's just a total lottery of who gets it and when. In the States, I think it's whoever can pay for it and what your health insurance is. I mean, you can correct me, that's what he was talking about. In Wales, we're not allowed to do it. I think we had one surgeon for an Iron Bevan that did. Um, he was allowed to do something like four, and he's done about 12 in the year, and so they've stopped him from doing any more. Uh, you know, it, it's really unfair. You shouldn't have your health care, well, the level of care that you can be, um, that you are, able to receive and achieve be based on where you live and I know that's the situation all around the world but it's wrong so he talked about that and talked about modulation being really cool um, it does lots of really good stuff for downstairs it changes the peripheral neural system within the bladder and um, we know there's loads and loads and loads of peripheral changes in how the, the threshold of the nerves um, within the bladder how they um, how often they fire at what level they'll fire and the stimulus that is then um, produced as a result of them firing so you get changes from top bottom up and top down so that's really cool um, then he said treat the pelvic floor before you treat anything else this guy is my favorite guy he's he's just I could make oh, cards with what he says and give them out to consultants um, yeah, exactly. We need to treat the pelvic floor. It's not the be and end-all. You need to have a good medical workup. You need to have a very good team around you, psychologists and nurses and the urologist and the gynaecologist. Um, and we're lucky to have those where, where I am. But um, it is very, very important because there's lots of different things that you can do. He talked about why the pelvic floor becomes overactive and painful. So in his, his theory... Um, and all of his work has led him to this idea that a physical trauma or a psychological um, uh, impulse or a physiological inflammation causes an increase in spasm and a reduced blood flow to the pelvic floor and this causes an accumulation of metabolites which over time results in ischemia and that metabolites produced from the ischemia produce the perpetuation in that cycle. Okay, there was some other stuff um, about that persistent contraction um, of the pelvic floor which was uh, Jason Kutch and Mr Chalimsky were talking about as well which were in the last vlog if you didn't catch it. Then uh, I want to talk a little bit about Melissa Farmer and her work, Dr Melissa Farmer, sorry Dr Melissa Farmer. Um, she's really cool and I was a little little bit of a fangirl, um, more than a little bit of a fangirl. Anyway I'm going to try and keep it together in this vlog. Um, so she did a really really cool talk about her work in mice and rats 
about the interplay between the peripheral system, the spinal system and the brain system and how mechanisms occur and um, adaptations occur in chronic visceral pain. She's done some super, super incredible work that um, I've kind of seen her name a few places, but and, and I've read some of the work before and not really kind of understood it. So actually having her say, well, we did this and this is what we found and then we did this and this is what we found made it all make sense, much more sense than it's going to make right now. Um, so she talked about pain. I really like this statement. Pain is a primary reinforcer. Do anything coupled with pain and you'll learn it um, at a really true brainy level. So chronic she talks about how chronic pain and addiction share um, brainy traits and that they're both very well learned habits. Um, she did some work in mice and rats. She wasn't very nice to these mice and rats and then she apparently had to watch them have sex a lot which is not great. Um, if it floats you back. The mat, rice or mats, rice or mats, mice or rats were infected with vulval yeast, so they got candida, and they were treated. So they gave them it they, and then they treated them it, with it. And they observed that after the third time they'd given them the, um, the thrush infection and then treated it, that mechanical allodynia remained. So their vulvas were still really sore. Um, and the in innovation to the vulva had completely changed and that also remains. So it shows that your body, the body is learning to adapt to the situation it's put in. So you have one infection, it's dealt with, you, you do your acute response, you get better. Then you have another infection and the body's kind of going, right, okay, I know what to do, acute response, get better. And the third time the body's like, I am well ahead of you. This keeps happening. I am just going to make sure that this area is really sensitive so I know when it's going to happen because it keeps happening so I can respond to it but unfortunately that means that sitting down isn't comfortable having sex isn't comfortable you're going to get um, a number of different issues related to that so that's a key finding and that's one that we see all the time in patients I ask them if they get chronic yeast infections all the time because we know that that mechanical sensitivity occurs if they've had more than about three bouts and we always ask about three bouts in one year um, then interestingly there was a lot of tongue-in-cheek in her, well not a lot, a little bit of tongue-in-cheek in her um, talk. Interestingly, she talked about how the pain site, where the pain site was originally, becomes greater because in visceral pain, um, when you've got a chronic visceral pain, the, the area can become much larger and diffuse depend because of how the viscera are innovated and how it's organised within our brain. So you get a bit of a crossover of different pain sites of where you're feeling the pain and how it feels when you touch different areas. Um, again, that's something I talked about in the last vlog, that we get a lot of carryover between IBS, fibromyalgia, back pain, vulval pain, provoked vestibulodynia, lots of these overlaps. Um, in the mice trials, the males were more resilient. So if downstairs hurt, um, and it became mechanically allodynic a little bit more, they continue to have sex. They're fine with it, they just crack on. Whereas the women, the female mice, um, had reduced sexual desires, but they still did occasionally have a, a bit of sex. But that's a really interesting point, and there's a huge can of worms there we could open trying to pick that apart, potentially talking about um, genetic, predispos genetic predispositions to um, continuation of a species and role and lots of stuff that I don't really want to get into now because I don't know enough about. Um, but that was really interesting and I think something to, to put in your mind. Then um, something with a massive star in my notes was in chronic pain of a year in duration the brain, uh, the area of the brain that's responsible for the perception of, of pain so dealing with that area and giving out, transmitting that, or emitting that, that feeling of pain or deciding or managing that that, that that response of pain is acceptable and appropriate given the situation, that area changes from where it should have been felt to, into the limbic system. So your emotional centre becomes the bit that manages how much pain you feel. That's really interesting. Um, and that goes right to the heart of how we talk to patients, how we manage their expectations, how we manage their coping strategies. And by doing those soft skills, as we call them, which I think are ridiculously important and in pelvic health, physio, women's health, men's health, um, we're very good at, I think. Um, we 
spend more time with patients, we really get to know them because we're in a closed, safe space with a door closed most of the time, which in normal physio you're not really if you're in um, curtains. And we really ask them about intimate details, so we do it in a way that is respectful. So that change in the area towards the limbic system means that your emotional centre is now managing your pain and pain becomes an emotionally maintained um, state which is independent of your environment so you it, it doesn't really matter how much we do with kind of pain specific treatments um, for the peripheries if you've got an emotionally managed pain state that we've known for a long time but it's a little bit more detail into it um, so next um, she talks about the mechanisms by which we initiate or initially experience pain are not the me um, the mechanisms by which they became become maintained and that's important to note um, so multifaceted treatment she talked about you need to have lots of different um, areas of treatment are become much more important now one of the things that was presented at conference was the Happify app or Happify website. I've got a couple of patients using it, they're trialling it for me at the moment. It's free, um, there are elements that you can pay for, but it does lots of psychological elements um, of treatment. So it, it's partially there for resilience building in coping strategies, partially there for pain understanding, partially there for actually changing how we're working with pain. So a lot of it is based on um, some of the things were, were kind of happy statements or doing kind acts because when you do a kind act you get a good amount of neural stimulation in certain areas um, a positive piggy bank so writing down something that is positive that's happened to you every day um, one of my patients calls it the happy clappy website the happy clappy thing which it, it, is, it is it's getting her to think happy thoughts and in a good way and actually I've started playing with that in treatment so when you finish treatment, can you can we visualise some happy stuff? Can we do some of the Happify on the way away from treatment to see if we can stop the immunological inflammatory flare that comes sometimes afterwards, which I say to patients all the time, treatment shouldn't be painful. Um, it shouldn't be something to be tolerated or we'll grin and bear through it. So if it is, then how are we doing that? Why are we doing this? Is there a better way of doing it? And actually involving some of these um, limbic system activity um limbic system activities may may help with your pain so last time was very much me talking about motor center planning motor planning motor activity um because we know that really changes and this time it's very much um how can we change the limbic system how can we change those kind of things i have some tea because it's cold the tea's not cold the tea's nice and warm um right then I'm going to have a go at the name. Dr. Gabe Hart um, presented on visceral pain and he did lots and lots and lots of lots of really exciting things but um, again some stuff that pulls together some themes of the conference. He talked about a convergence of visceral pain and how that creates a widespread pain state and that that widespreadedness of how pelvic pain is um, is important. Um, it's also important, he says, to note that the nerves from the bowels enter at the spinal cord levels of the sacrum thoracic. So the amount of overlap that you can have within the body is a quite a large area. Um, I don't often people get people with thoracic pain or kind of mid back pain with low back, with, with pelvic pain specifically. I'd say it's much more of a kind of pelvic lumbar um, overflow, but it's not unheard of. But anyway, he was really interesting. I think that also speaks to potentials for um, diaphragm overlap. So if you're getting plugged into the thoracic, how can the, we know that bowels have a massive effect on the pressure state within the abdomen? So is this another route in which we can be affecting the um, negatively affecting how much the diaphragm goes through its range of motion? Um, he also talked at about the fact that persistent organ inflammation is not needed to maintain visceral hypersensitivity. So that's really building on what we know from Dr. Farmer, that adaptations to how our tissues respond, um, they happen quickly and they may continue to present like an inf acute inflammation even though it's actually a secondary mechanical, secondary allergenic um, issue. Um, 
that our nerve endings have modulated, or not nerve endings, um, but our neural system has modulated how it responds to input. So the threshold's gonna be lower for it to fire, and then those signals coming into the brain are gonna be interpreted differently by different areas. So you don't, you know, that makes me think a lot about IBS um, and other bowel disorders that are there for a long time that have these flares that, again, do we need to be treating the brain? Doesn't mean that I'm just talking to people but what activities can we do with the brain alongside our physical treatments um, to really try and achieve change. Dr Aziz um, Abrit woo, from QMU um, discussed autonomic dysregulation in functional GI disorders. He was great, I think I heard him speak a few years ago and he's really interesting, really nice guy. Um, and I haven't got his slides but he discussed the enteric nervous system and interestingly presented that a higher resting parasympathetic tone um, produced an increase in the descending inhibitory subcortical network to help reduce pain in those with esophageal pain. So if you have a better parasympathetic activity within your um, body, then you have a reduction in esophageal pain. Now we've seen this before, this is building a little bit on what um, uh, Mr Chalimsky um, talked about, um, what Jason Kutch talked about and some others that if we can improve parasympathetic activity then we might be able to change pain. So that talks to Mr Chalimsky's interval training protocol. If you've not seen it, heard it, um, go back to the last vlog. Um, deep diaphragmatic breathing which we know has some vagal nerve stimulation or even the new vagal nerve stimulators that you can put on your neck. Terrify me, don't think I'll be able to use them but um, certainly not on myself. But could be useful. So how can we get people doing um, parasympathetic activity stuff. If you've got any other ideas, let me know. Um, I have started all my patients on interval training um, with varying levels of success at the moment, but we'll get there. Um, next up, or rather a few on, something else that's interesting. Dr. Puckle, um, discuss in discussing vulvodynia, talked about women with vulvodynia being two to three times more likely to report an inflammatory history of things like hives or um, allergies or yeast infections. So again, we're getting this process building about talking a bit about tissue resilience in the vulva. Um, I mean, this was in the vulvodynia um, cluster, but talking about how our tissues respond, how resilient are they to repeat traumas and that really they aren't. So we know from uh, Mr. Farmer's work that um, it was the third time round of these yeast infections in mice that those real significant changes were seen at the level of the tissues. So in our own patients, yeast infections is something that we see all the time in chronic pain. But what else, what other kind of uh, tissue resilience do we need to be thinking about? So hives, other inflammatory responses to allergies, um, gut responses to uh, kind of food tolerance issues. There's a wealth of stuff out there, but again, that speaks to the immunological changes, um, which was another theme coming through conference. So if we've got this underlying potential pro-inflammatory elements of their genetics, they might not be able to downregulate their immune response, their inflammation response, which might heighten their systemic response, which in general is gonna increase their inflammation and pain. So in women with vulval pain, um, they had an increased no number of fibres, uh, nerve fibres at the vulva, and they were also able to perceive touch. They could perceive touch um, where normal women couldn't, because they, they were much, much heightened, and they could also perceive pain where normal women would perceive um, touch. So those stimuli were greater, so that's a kind of ramping up on the um, old amplifier in the brain. She was a huge supporter of physiotherapy, and that it should be the primary intervention for women with vulval pain um, and noted that it's important to consider the context in which you you talk about vulval pain so it's really important to talk about family um, about their social situation about work about all the uh, the rest of things that go on in the life because you need that psychological tie-in and you need to build links with the brain and how it's working in that situation so you can't consider someone you know as it used to be in msk when people came in and they'd be like oh i've got a shoulder next i've got an elbow oh i've got this wrist it's not a wrist, it's a person, and that person may want their wrist to play tennis, or they may actually be sedentary or whatever, but you've got to consider the patient. We know this, um, but she was pointing it out quite nicely. 
Dr. Harlow built on some of those comments um, about the immunological response. I can't say that word. Um, and that creates the situation in which pain can be expressed from the vulva. Um, and his etiological hypothesis was that vulvodynia is a result of an immunological process. And I think that was nothing new, given everyone else that had presented before him. I think if I'd read that on its own, I'd be quite surprised. But actually, um, in the context it was, in which it was presented, when everyone was saying the same thing, makes sense. Women are ten with ten or more yeast infections were five times more likely to report vulval pain. Again, we're talking about this tissue resilience. Um, and his team, really cool, are currently working on microbiome diversity in women with vulval pain and looking at whether um, there's kind of a role for the reorganisation of the microbiome in these women. That's really cool. I know that um, Professor Malone Lee's team at... Uh, where are they? They're in London somewhere. Oh, the Whittington, there we go. Um, are looking at microbiome organisation, reorganisation in chronic bladder infections, um, trying to improve the ratio of how everything is and pie chart with all the ratio, uh, making it more organised, um, finding which bits it is that kill other bits that make everything jump into line. Finally, Dr. Goldstein discussed an interesting element of vulva pain, um, which I never knew, which is really cool, um, which I'm going to test for every now and then. So women with umbilical hypersensitivity, or the umbilicus, um, in the womb, there's a little bit, women can have this kind of congenital, um, what's it called? Um, a left area, an area that's kind of left over from the um, the clitoris and the kind of the vulva um, or the vestibule um, which then becomes part of the umbilicus and it means that they get a really sensitive umbilicus and they don't like it being touched. Those women are more likely to get vulvodynia because this hypersensitivity in this leftover area of the, um, of the vestibule um, has a congenital neuroproliferation neuro which means that they have much greater numbers of nerve endings. Um, he suggested that you look at redness at the vulva and the umbilicus, um, response of the umbilicus to touch, and resilience of the mucosa to kind of discuss, to look at how um, active or reactive the vulva is. And that's, I think that's something we do anyway within physio. And this, this idea of dermal resilience is something that I've been talking about for a while. So it's good to see um, a few things coming through, tying together different areas of um, pelvic pain and how we can change the experience of someone potentially internally by doing stuff they wouldn't even consider so giving them creams or giving them things that will um give them not you know not numb the pain but give them creams that will improve the resilience of the tissues to then to be able to behave normally so today wrapping up some other knowledge bombs from conference we've kind of talked a little bit about how it's important to have an idea of the immune function of your patient, how reactive they are to stuff, the resilience of the tissues, um, and also, really importantly, yes, that really cool, um, the really cool findings coming out about the role of motor changes in pelvic pain, and specifically bladder pain or urological pelvic pain syndromes, um, is important. But also, we now know that in visceral pain syndromes, of which bladder pain. Um, comes under the general umbrella of you can get an increase in how much that the limbic system takes over that function of reporting and adjusting and deciding how much pain should be emitted or what the appropriate response is in a chronic pain state to allow the brain the rest of the brain to kind of get on and be open to having to deal with other areas so we need to think limbic we need to be thinking emotional centers so i hope that's been useful um i hope that you've finished your cup of tea and i've not rambled on too much um, and as new stuff comes out and I find it interesting, I will be doing more of these. So, um, it was nice talking to you. Thank you for listening all the way to the end. I've been Jilly Bond. You can find me at Jilly underscore Bond on Twitter or on Facebook. Um, and I'm sure we'll be talking soon. Uh, please get back to me if there's anything that you want to talk about or you found interesting or, um, you've got ideas for that motor planning or how we can involve the limbic system in treatment. Um, I'm really, I'm all ears. I'd love to discuss this. It's really boring talking to yourself. Um, so I'd like to have 
I love discussions and debates, so get in touch.